Hello, hello. Welcome to the very first uh, Data API Builder Community Standup. We're so excited to have y'all joining us. Welcome, David and, and Jerry. How are y'all today? Terrific. Thanks. Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, this is exciting. We This is our very first one. We've been wanting to talk about Data API Builder for the longest time. And so this is a great opportunity to start to fold in our community. And we have a, an active community that's excited for general availability that's coming soon. And uh, we have a lot of features that we have basically just finished recently. So it's fun for us to think about talking about those and talk about the current work that's going on as we approach GA. So uh, mm -hmm. this is this is the, the first, I hope, of several um, community standups that we'll have where we can start to engage anybody who is, uh, you know, wanting to be, want, wanting to wanting to engage the team directly through us or maybe find out more about the project. So thanks, Haley. I appreciate uh, getting started here. Yeah. And everyone, as always, please put your comments or questions in the chat uh, and, and we'll add them to the screen and talk, talk through them as we go along. Great. Um, let, let me start by just introducing Davide. So Davide, uh, he was he's this is his brainchild. This is where it all started. Somewhere Davide's taking a shower one day and he looks up into the <laughs> ceiling and he thinks to himself, you know what we need? We need an engine that is configuration based that will make it easier to interact with all of the databases in Azure data uh, through an API uh, without requiring developers to rewrite the same code over and over again just have a nice reliable engine that's built on standards and follows all the same development practices that engineers do anyway, yep. but not require them to have all that code, not require them to have this part of their CI CD pipeline and all of the unit tests that, it, that surround yeah. that as well. That's right. And uh, Davide, tell me, tell me about the, the moment of inspiration. Oh. <laughs> it's been a while, right? It's been a couple yeah. of years when this, since this even came together. Absolutely. No, it's been a while, but uh, again, we, we are all developers here, I guess. And we know how many times we have uh, written like a CRUD service. Like, I don't know, 100? Like, and it, every time is always the same, right? It doesn't really change much. But still... Uh, it's, uh, it's needed to be performant, secure, configurable, all the usual stuff. And, and this is just to do a simple select many of the times, right? But then you add on top uh, the ability that you want to, let's say, paginate or filter or search for, uh, or only select some projects or select only some specific properties of your entities, right? And I, and I was really looking forward to have something that uh, I can just configure in the in the, um, and just run it without having me to write the code every time and actually it turned out speaking with customer and developers going to conferences that almost everyone was looking for something like that so i said well we should uh, we should do it uh, and here we are well let let me let me start by saying one of the important things about having something like this well let's clarify this is not a code generation tool you no, are going right. to be yeah. You're not yeah. pointing at your database and it creates all the POCO objects and yeah. all the other things like you might expect this to be. This is something else. Kind of describe it to us, yeah. Davide. Uh, maybe I can do better. I can just uh, share my screen and show how it works. So let me so let me do two things here. Let me move this on this side and uh, present, uh, share my screen. Uh, this one, fantastic. Okay, you should be able to see my screen, thank you, perfect. Let me zoom in, okay. So let me, first of all, start a, a SQL server on my machine. Oh, of course I need to start Docker before. So let me do that. Uh, and in the meantime, let me go exactly to this folder, start uh, Visual Studio. And I already have a configuration file. We can start from there, I think. Uh, that shows exactly what you were discussing. Like, uh, this is not a... <clears throat> code generator. So you right. just have to uh, configure the configuration file. It contains basically, right? Because probably if you have a hundred table, you made all. So here you just say, uh, let me zoom in. So yeah, here we go another one 
So let's say I have a table called books that I want to make a rest endpoint, turn into a rest endpoint. That's basically what I have to write. Now, this seems to be a lot, but actually it can be generated quickly with the CLI that we have. Uh, the point here is to show that if you want, you can actually generate the configuration on your own using just any uh, application because it's just JSON. And it tells the API builder what is the object that you want to expose. And once that is done, again, let me start, uh, SQL command start. And I'm starting my SQL server, fantastic. Uh, and then uh, let me also connect to the database and make sure that you see what I have in my table. Uh, but basically what will happen is that uh, that is the only, the only thing that the data API builder needs, just an information on uh, the table. Then of course, uh, our goal uh, was, is to make sure that the API builder behaves like the application you would have written yourself. So we allow any personalization, like you can even specify for the GraphQL object is created, uh, uh, how it should be actually named, uh, both using singular and plural, because you know that GraphQL, if you have a list, uh, you should use a plural name. If you just return a single object, you should use a singular one. If you want to have uh, REST enabled and at what path uh, uh, the table will be available, uh, all the permission that you can imagine here to make sure that uh, your table is accessible for read or write or, uh update for example by everyone or by only those who wait dub, they, let me back or... you up just for a second yeah okay yeah, so this yeah. this looks like this is going to create a data api that is a rest api or is it mm -hmm. going to create a data data api that's a graph ql api because it looks like it, it you have both specified in this right. configuration file that, that's right so we are going to do both right you can choose uh, uh, but we know that GraphQL and REST are kind of uh, very well received uh, in, by mm -hmm. the developer community and it really depends what you prefer, right? Some prefer REST, some prefer GraphQL. Um, so we decided to uh, allow you to use both. Uh, by default, they are both enabled, but you can decide that you only want to have REST or GraphQL uh, and that's it. Got it. So it's not a choice between the two. You can have both at the same time if you want. That's to. right. So, yep, so let's let's make it a uh, practical, right? So this is my table. I want you to create a, a client application, right? Because I'm very bad at front-end and I know you are good with uh, uh, the front-end part. So how do we work together? Well, typically you, maybe you as a front-end uh, uh, don't really like working on the back-end. So you will ask someone to create, uh, again, the, the CRUD service. So I'm that guy uh, that will create a um, CRUD service. Typically we take, at least days, if not weeks, or I can just uh, do the API builder. And actually, let me let me just do this. Let me do dot old. Let me go here and clear everything and say dub init. So we can start from the scratch, right from scratch. So I'm deciding which database I want to use. And that's another important thing. We don't only support Azure SQL. We support all the database in Azure. Uh, then I want to see all the logs, so I'm in development mode, and uh, I want to specify the connection string. Uh, I don't want to have my connection string in clear text in my file, uh, so I'm using an environment variable. That will create a, a um, configuration file for me. So I, most people aren't going to have DAB already installed. If they are install this, it's part of uh, it's a .NET tool that you can install directly. So it's a cross platform oh, yes. tool. That's right. That's you right. can have that on Windows device. You can have that on a Mac. It doesn't matter. All, as long as That's you have right. .NET as the driver installed, you can go to .NET yep. tools and do the installation directly. Correct. Correct. And, uh, and here is the configuration file that is being created for me. And as you can see, entities is empty. Now let me add uh, the table, right? So tab add, let's say book. And actually I can, uh, yeah. So let's say book. Source is going to be dbo.books and then permissions, permissions must be, let's say that uh, anonymous, everything. So I'm saying uh, I want to expose the table books and I want for now that anyone can do anything. Maybe let's be a little bit more precise. Let's say I just want everyone to be able to read. Got it. Okay, here we go, done. So all the configuration is created for me, right? Uh, and now I can do. Now wait uh, before you go any further. Start. Yep. Let's yep. talk. Let's talk about why you called it book in the first place. So book right there on line thirty-three 
is so that you can reference this inside the configuration file, right? Because right now That's it seems right. so simple because there's just one table, but eventually you could have many tables and you might even want to specify relationships between those tables. And That's so right. you'll need to call them something. And That's this is right. the way yep. you're going to do it. Yes. Got it. Yeah. And I see that by default, it has both um, REST and graph enabled. Uh-huh. Correct. Yeah, because we, I mean, I, I think, and we thought that this is the most common situation. Again, you can even uh, uh, disable uh, REST and GraphQL, uh, not for each entities, because if you have many entities, it will be like a long work, right? So you can just uh, uh, decide if REST or GraphQL are enabled at the runtime level, which be applicable to all your uh, uh, entities, mm -hmm. uh, or you can do it on a per entity basis. So again, a maximum configurability here. And let me now- All right, what's the next there? table you were gonna add in there? Oh, I can, uh, so in my database, of course, I have also authors, right? Uh, and then I have the connection between authors and uh, and books, uh, and we can do maybe it easy later. Uh, okay. But basically we can, we can really uh, uh, let this relationship emerge. Uh, everything that uh, you will publish on Data API Builder is something you must actively do. Uh, because we didn't want to um, basically uh, give you to have any any chance to create uh, unwanted leaks from a from a security perspective, right? So, so, so you can't say dbo dot star and just get all of your no. Games. That's right. Uh, that yeah. maybe is something that we will evaluate in future. We felt at the beginning would have been too dangerous from a security perspective. Yeah, for uh, sure. So that's why. Uh, Davide, let me ask you some yep. technical questions. If I'm mm -hmm. adding my um, table. Are there any requirements around that table? Does it have to be structured in a special way in order to qualify to be added to this configuration file? No, uh, it can have a, uh, no, well, sorry, let me uh, just uh, take a step back. The only requirement is that uh, it needs to have a primary key, uh, which is basically the most basic requirement you can think of. Uh, um, but even in that case, if, if let's say you want to ex expose a view, because we can also expose a view, right? Via configuration file, you can always supply information we cannot infer from a database. So let's say you want to expose a view and the view doesn't have a primary key per se, right? Especially if the view is complex, has a lot of joins. So you can always provide in the configuration file here, let's say I switch this to view. Uh, and then here I can uh, specify, for example, the key fields. So ah. we allow you to, Basically, do whatever you want. Again, the, the goal is to make this as something you would have created yourself. And probably you will not create something for yourself that you cannot use if you don't have a primary key on a table. So you can always provide additional metadata that will help the TPA Builder to do its work. But if you don't, we will try to figure that out from a database metadata. So you Got don't it. Have so if, my if I don't have a primary key, I can give you the fields to use that are That's effectively right. the primary That's right. key. That's right. I mean, again, now I noticed that you changed it to view, Davide. I can su uh, you support tables, then uh, data views. API builder supports views. What anything and else? Store a procedure for uh, relational databases, and if you are using it on Cosmos DB, also collections. So I see pretty much cool. the whole spectrum. Yeah. So let's now run things. This is running and this is the latest version. So you see, we, we get some metadata automatically. We figure out the primary key. Uh, you can even change names if you want. Like let's say you have your primary key is called ID, but you want to call it something, you can. Uh, there is a section called mapping that maybe we can take a look later. But uh, this again, just to give you an idea of how flexible and how configurable the TP Builder is, right? And now I can just, uh, for example, let's go here. Uh, let me... And then while that loads, yeah. David, let me just point out that yep. there are a lot of defaults in DAB. And, you know, one of the philosophies behind it is to get started as fast as possible. That's so, right. So, yeah, you can definitely map your fields so that your columns come across a different way. But that's not yep. required at the beginning. You can definitely provide key keys to us, but that's not required at yep. the beginning. You can Correct. have relationships between tables, but that's not required at the beginning. We just want to make it so that the... The, yep. the, the getting started friction is completely gone and you can start having a, a data API on top of your database as, as fast as possible. That's exactly the goal. That's right. Uh, yeah, basically you, you say that uh, start as fast as possible, but don't be limited uh, in the way you want your API behave, both in names or configuration and everything. So that was exactly the goal. Uh, and um, for example, here you see that we support also Swagger, so Open uh, API, 
and our API are uh, available at the slash API configuration. Why? Because here, the path was specified to be API. You want to call it REST, you want to call it uh, something else, feel free to do so. Uh, the TAPI builder will just work. Uh, and then here you have all the methods that have been enabled. For example, I can do get, uh, let's get all the books. So I can go try it out uh, and you will uh, uh, see execute. You will see all the books here. It's fantastic. Now you really uh, haven't done very much, Davide. You created this little file saying dab init, and then you added one table saying dab add, and then you just right. ran it. Okay, that's, right. that's beautiful. That's right. So this is for Swagger. Uh, as, as you see, we can also have uh, ability to select some field or to filter for some field using a something that's very similar to an audit expression. It's kind of a subset of a data uh, order. Uh, uh, take only the first n uh, or uh, go to the next page because, of course, we also allow pagination. But the other thing's interesting is again, you can go instead to GraphQL. Then, since everything has been developed using open open uh, um, open source tools, and here we are using uh, Hot Chocolate, it's very easy to use the Hot Chocolate Playground, uh, Banana Cake Pop, uh, and just uh, write a query. So let me start from scratch. Query, and let's say I want to have my books. Fantastic. And here, since I have a li uh, set of book, I want to get all the items. And let's say I want to have the ID and the title and what else, the year and the pages. Nice. Fantastic. Run. Here we go. Now, some developers uh -huh. might be watching uh, Davide, and they may not realize the difference between REST and graph endpoints. But one of the most significant ones is um, there's only one endpoint when you use GraphQL. Right. Uh, yeah. GraphQL allows you to, to query all the different entities from one place, where REST endpoints, you have one endpoint per entity. Correct. And also, well, it's different uh, in the sense that uh, with REST, you have to code the behavior yourself. So if you don't want to support an insert, you will not have, uh, let's say, a post uh, method support, right? With GraphQL, you actually have uh, uh, two different concepts. You have queries that mm -hmm. uh, basically is the uh, kind of the payload that you send to get something back, or you have something called mutation, where you is actually you are instructing uh, the engine to change data as opposed to returning it. And uh, the nice thing about GraphQL is that, is that it comes with full schema. So if you go here, you will see that uh, there is an object called book, and again, why it is called books actually? Uh, because well, this returns a collection of uh, books, and uh, because uh, here we call it books plural, right? We could nice. have called it something else if we want, but again, uh, we we try just to follow the best practice for uh, for GraphQL. Uh, book by the instead return a single item, so it returns an object called book. And how a book look like? Well, it's exactly the column that we found in the database and we mapped to a GraphQL type. Now, you because you only have a single entity, it seems yep. really straightforward and comparable to a REST endpoint. But yep. a REST endpoint, if I want to do an update or an insert or a delete, I use those different methods against mm -hmm. the same endpoint. But I'm always using the POST method against a GraphQL, and I just That's specify right. the type of mutation inside Correct. it. Correct. Yeah, and uh, actually here, uh, this uh, allows me also to show something interesting. You see there are no mutation here. So why that is happening? Well, it's very easy to understand because the only action allowed is read. So we don't right. generate uh, uh, any additional overhead if you are not allowed uh, to write uh, or update or delete. So let's change this to star. Um, I know that we just released the latest version that supports uh, uh, hot reload, uh, but just for the sake of the demo, I'm restarting it. And uh, if I now go here and uh, do uh, refresh, so I refresh the schema. Uh, is this start? By the way, it, yes. it's worth pointing out that everything that works inside GraphQL works because of the schema. And so yeah. uh, the DAB engine automatically creates a schema based on the entities you've provided and also based on all of the, it queries the database to get all of the metadata around those entities. So we get all the columns and all the types, and we basically create a dynamic schema that you're able to use inside of your um, inside of your DAB implementation. So yeah. all of that happens for free. If you were to build your own GraphQL endpoint, you would have to build your own schema generation, and you would have to have your own um, uh, 
resolvers on the back end to make it yeah. work. It's beautiful once it's done, but it is a lot of code to of do work. it right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because basically, as you said, if I want to support uh, creation, deletion, and uh, and uh, book updates, I have to manually write the code to intercept uh, the mutation that asked me to do uh, creation of book and write the code uh, to do that, which is fantastic uh, because at the end, uh, it allows uh, the front-end developer, you in this case, to be uh, completely free in deciding what you want to do. Uh, but uh, on the server side, I have a lot of work to do in order to give you that freedom, right? Right. Um, so it's beautiful, but it uh, it requires a lot of work unless you have the API builder, because mm. right. <laughs> the API builder you just uh, you just basically um, configure it and and you're good to go. Now, I could, for example, create a, a mutation here uh, that would say create book, for example. And here I can specify the ID, uh, the title, whatever, and I will have the book created. So very, uh, very straightforward. Yeah, that's mm. nice. So maybe also, let me just also go to aka.dub mm -hmm. and just uh, take a look at the overall architecture and, uh, and also make sure that everyone knows that they are more than welcome to use DAB, download it, uh, use it on premises, in the cloud. It's an open source project, so it's absolutely free to use. But I also want to stress that uh, it's also absolutely um, great uh, that you can actually help. We have a, a discussion forum that is pretty rich. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, people submitting issues uh, or even uh, uh, suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, and so make sure that uh, if you use DAB, you're also part of the DAB community and help uh, uh, improving uh, DAB. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, uh, requests and, uh, and uh, discussion going on already, which I find super nice because it helps us to make the product uh, exactly what we want as developers, right? And Davide, go back to the code tab and scroll down to the readme just for a second. One of the things yep. that developers can do is if they want to become more involved and uh, more connected to emails that go out and things like that as well, the first couple lines of the readme uh, oh, point yep. to a, uh, a file that you can, or a form that you can fill out and kind of join the community. And so That's it's right. a nice way to let us know that you know this is an open source project without built-in telemetry. We're not sniffing in yeah. all the things that you're doing. <laughs> so we don't know if you're using it. So if you want to join in and be part of it, this is a great way to do it and for us to figure it out. And let me ask you some typical questions. So I've talked to a lot of Microsoft customers who are interested in this because they either don't have the capacity inside or they don't have the, um, maybe they don't even have the competence inside to go and build an entire a data API layer over the data that they have. But they know that this is a strategic thing. They know that um, this is the way that the world is sort of going so that we can stitch together all of our different data sources through an API layer and control it there rather than having direct access to the database in any way. And so they want to have this. Let me ask you, Davide. Uh, so you already said it's open source. Yep. And that, that means that it's free. But is there a, like a special tier? Is there going to be a premium tier to this? Well, that's what we are planning, right? Uh, um, so there are two things that uh, uh, that will be happening in future. Something is already happening right now. So the 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 first uh, thing I, I want to make sure that everyone knows is that uh, Data API Builder is a uh, really nicely integrated uh, uh, with Static Web Apps. Uh, actually, Static mm -hmm. Web Apps is one of my favorite uh, uh, Azure services because it allows uh, me as a full stack developer to just as have one service where I can deploy my front end, I can have a function running my back end, and now I can also have Data API Builder that uh, helps mm. me to have my uh, CRUD service. Like Data API Builder uh, is integrated uh, in Static Web Apps uh, with a feature called Database Connections. So the, the beautiful part of that is that I don't even have to think about deploying Data API Builder because you said it's a .NET application, right? Um, Right. So typically, I may uh, I may um, think to deploy the API builder in a container that works perfectly, or in a VM, or even hosting locally. But with static web apps, I only have to deploy one thing: the configuration file. That's it. I don't even think about you know where I host the API builder because Azure will do it for me. Mm -hmm. Right now, we are in private pre in public preview. 
and everything is free. So you can use uh, static web apps for free. Uh, there is a free tier there. You can use Azure Function for free. There is a free tier up to 1 million uh, requests per month. And also the DP Builder uh, at the moment is freer. And of course, we, we plan to keep a free tier to make sure that any developers from the most junior to the most experienced can try it out without you know, having to uh, uh, be concerned about the cost. And the idea long term is, of course, also add a premium tier where companies that want to have support uh, or better performance or security or enterprise uh, features like uh, VPNs and everything, they, they can also find that. Yes. Right. So that is something and that, that we've come that on. That sort of special capability is going to come from integration into specific Azure services that will allow us to just natively like snap into it so that you might go in and, and try and decide where you're going to host your container. And mm -hmm. we can go to a container service inside that's Azure right. and there's a drop down and there's DAB. And so that's kind of what we're saying when there's a premium yep. tier. What's what we're not saying, however, is that there's two forks of this code, one of them that yep. has a certain set of features and another that has more. Um, there a dab Correct. is dab. Correct. And it, you know, it already naturally and, and kind of seamlessly integrates with most of the services anyway. So for example, a lot of people will put API manager in front of their data APIs, which that's is right. beautiful. That yeah. works perfectly with data yeah. API builder as well. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Uh, and uh, and the other beautiful things I like uh, that we we managed to <laughs> to do, which is uh, was not that uh, kind of uh, obvious, is to make sure that we can actually deploy and release everything in the open source almost every couple of months, right? Because uh, uh, okay. we started one year ago. We deployed, we released the API builder with a constant uh, uh, deployment time of like couple of uh, couple of months or two three months, uh, depending on the season and yep. the vacation in in the mid, in between uh but we just released the uh, and actually you 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 led uh, this effort uh, the latest version uh, 0 0.10 uh and maybe you can give us some uh, hints on it since you you you're now the lead pm yeah let's go ahead and talk just a little bit about where the project is right now and so mm -hmm. let me let me back up and just reiterate what you said so if you're creating a a proof of concept today for your enterprise and you want to show this to your manager or whoever, um, starting at static web apps is the right way to go because static web apps takes all the complexity away and basically gives you the container behind the scenes completely transparent to you. And so all of a sudden by providing only this JSON file and of course having a database that it can call, then it will automatically give you this yeah. data endpoint and allow you to interact with it, honestly, with a single file. And so that is... Mm -hmm definitely the right place to go. However, it may not be where you end up. It may You may end up as an enterprise hosting this on Azure container apps or mm -hmm. something like that, or maybe a Kubernetes cluster that you have. All of that makes sense as well. But if you're starting at a POC, it's a beautiful place to go. And honestly, if you have a single application with a single endpoint, this might actually be the last place you go to. Static web apps is, you know, it's feature rich, it's, it's dab behind the scenes. And so you're getting everything that you want to there as well. So it's kind of gonna be driven by your requirements and what they yeah. are. So if we step back to the beginning of last year, we were looking closer to around, um, that would have been like dot seven, I suppose. And it's really where we started to see the maturity of DAB get mm -hmm. to a point where we could really expect users to enjoy using it and be able to create real POCs in anticipation of general availability this yeah. year. And so that was, that was where we started to, we went public preview at that time. And we started introducing all of the basic features. And so we started doing all the things that were geared specifically towards developers and things that you've already shown. So we have open AI as a specification that you can access directly and it's automatically generated. Swagger is included so that you can interact and test all of your REST endpoints. And then we have the GraphQL um, uh, banana cake pop that you can interact with as well. All that's there only when the development mode is, or only when the environment mode is set to development. Once you yeah. put that into production, all of that gets stripped away for security That's reasons right. like you would want to. As well as all of security stuff that really are the kind of, the, the that's the, that's the, you can't even go any farther if you don't have that sort of thing. So we started seeing things like in, interaction or integration with um, uh, Azure Active Directory, which now we call Intra ID. So we have full, uh, you know, integration yeah. there as well as using JWT tokens and the easy auth that's built into static web apps. That's also where we made friends with the static web app team 
and started having integrations natively there as well. And, and that really changed the entire kind of getting started experience so that everything worked really fast. Yep. And then we turned our attention as we got into the summer to making sure that all of the the things that are potential blockers for enterprises to be able to adopt this are gone as well. And so we start talking about other features like observability, CICD integration, to make sure that everything you expect to have inside a data, API, a data API is already there. So you and I were both engineers, Davide. If we yep. were building our own um, API, we would do it right. And so as a result, yeah. this is done right as well because it makes no sense for us to have a data API engine that is full of compromises. We wanted them instead to have an engine that we can provide to an engineer they can be proud of, they can go through a yep. code review, they can go through an architectural review and come out shining on the other side. So that That's includes right. full security as well as things like um, scalability through all the different container options that we have, as well as things like um, yeah, built-in in-memory caching, retry policies, yes. and all the things that are just yes. native to any data API that you want behind That's, the scenes. That's right. Yeah, and caching is something we just added uh, with the last version, right? And that is like, bread and butter for a developer. The moment you create an API, usually the second thing you, you want to add is caching, right? Because yeah. it doesn't really make sense to hammer database every single time. So, and so we added caching recently. You can choose the time to leave for the cache. We are using an amazing, amazing library called Fusion Cache that is done actually by an MVP that allows us, first of all, to start uh, right now just having an in-memory cache locally, but we will yeah. soon also uh, introduce the ability to have a distributed cache using Redis. Uh, and what developer are not using Redis today? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I think everyone doing API ends up using Redis and saving some cash there. Um, so again, it just goes in the direction that you said. Like, we built uh, this product uh, for the developers, not to be enjoyed by developers, used as they would have created the, it themselves. And uh, I, I, I think we are uh, heading in the right direction. So um, actually, Jerry, there are a few questions. So maybe we can start answering them. Uh, let's start, uh, let's see. Well, first of all, I'm happy that to see people uh, uh, joining uh, our first uh, uh, stand up. Um, so there are a couple of interesting questions here. Uh, um, the first one is uh, uh, on how to contribute. Uh, Travis is asking, uh, the best way to contribute would be to go to the GitHub repository, thanks, and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, contribute like any other project, open source project. I would say yes, uh, uh, you submit a PR, you, we have a process that asks you maybe to be a little bit more speci specific on uh, what, what you are proposing so that uh, our engineers uh, can evaluate it. But other than that, it's just any other open source uh, project. Right. I think that's that's an important point to make. When we say that we're open source, we mean it. Uh, there really yeah. is a, a community aspect to this that we are excited to take pull requests as well. At the same time, we want DAB to succeed and we want to get to GA and we want to see adoption come quickly. So we're pouring in the same sort of engineering assets mm -hmm. on the on our side to make sure that features are getting written, bugs are getting addressed, and we're getting the code base to a point where it's ready for general availability. So. Um, in right. fact, let me speak just for a moment about versions for a second, Davide. Mm -hmm. So um, yesterday, this week sometime, I guess, is the official release of uh, 0 .0, 0 0.10, right? So obviously, we'll get to one when we go to GA. So we, we're slowly working our way up. And uh, that's where we introduced caching, as a matter of fact. So it is really is a brand new feature. And a couple of other things as well. And so then we'll go to an odd release. So dot .11 will come in a month. And the odd release is really our stability release. So we have feature releases, and then we'll have stability releases where all the different issues that might co come together, all the different testing against the new features, we'll start revealing anything that needs to be polished. And so in about a month, we'll see um, dot 11 come along. And then after that, we'll see the final set of uh, features being built. And really, there's not that much left that we have planned. Yeah. A, a few of nested mutations inside uh, GraphQL. And um, and then the hot reload of the configuration file. So those two things are still kind of in the backlog. And so we, then we'll see version 12. Tra 12 will be stabilized as well, and then we'll transition into version one. So we'll yeah. see that in, we'll probably announce it in May, but if you are interacting with DAB through the repository, you'll see the release show up sometime yeah. in April. And so that's the kind of the beauty yeah. of the whole thing. However, yeah. 
if you're a developer and you, you're looking at this and you're like, I, if they don't have this one feature, if they don't have this one capability, can I still, you know, fork it and contribute? Don't just fork it and contribute. Obviously, you want to have an issue first where you start having a discussion around what it's going to look like, what the architecture of whatever the check, the fixes that you're going to do, and then volunteer for it as well so that we don't go and do it while you're doing it at the same time. Then, yes, yeah. completely. You would fork it, branch it, do your change, and then have a pull request right back into it. So yeah. it is a full-on, for real, uh, open source project managed right now by Microsoft with the underlying intent to make it so that the Azure databases are easy to interact with through a data API that make it so you don't have to build it yourself. So that's, I, I, right. that's, a, that's a great question and an important one because I think a lot of people might misunderstand yeah. that this is a Microsoft product. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, no, it's fully open and we, we really, as you said, believe in that. Um, actually, I even uh, contributed uh, myself uh, a tiny, tiny uh, PR. Comment, uh, a comment in white space. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and actually, I think at some point we should also bring some, some engineers uh, to the community meeting. I'm, I'm sure some of them will be uh, super happy to interact directly with, uh, with people using their products. So, uh, as soon as we move on with this series, we'll definitely do that. Um, Davide, I see another, I, yeah, I, I, I see another question that I want to kind of jump into, and I think it's a it's a perfect question when you think about the simplicity of DAB. So Rob asks a question that says, with all this stuff coming from the database, it would be you could create it just based off of a query if you wanted to. Why not generate mm -hmm. it from this configuration file from a query? Yeah. By the way, that would that's a great idea. And there's no reason we can't have tooling that kind of circles around the ecosystem of DAB to be able to help build out these configuration files. Totally not, um, not against that idea for sure. However, think about this from a company's point of view that has, you know, a hundred tables. What kind of query are you going to write that will really reveal sufficient information about a hundred tables? You could write 50 queries, two tables each, or maybe a hundred queries. And all of a sudden you can start to see that the interaction with the database becomes almost as complex as just writing the CLI to interact with the configuration file as well. There's no right answer to this. We, we don't have a tool that could do something like this, but it'd be interesting to see one kind of brainstormed out to see yeah. what it could look like. So why but, not do it? It's a great idea. It's a great no, idea. But, that's why uh, we're open source. That, that, that's absolutely a great idea. And uh, actually uh, in the discussion, uh, I posted a script uh, that uh, creates the JSON file by using the information in database so that uh, uh, it just generates uh, the JSON file with all the table. Um, uh, I'm not uh, kind of, uh, um, from a security perspective, I, I as a, if I were a developer, I would yeah. be a little bit concerned of uh, something that will by default take any new table, potentially also table that I don't know they existed and make it available uh, uh, on the web, right? Uh, on the internet. Because let's say that there is a new table with uh, credit cards in it. Like you really want to make sure that you know what you are exposing, right? Having said that, uh, I understand that if you have a big uh, databases, uh, you want to have kind of a head start uh, instead of having to write manually for 100 times dub add something. That's right. why we decided to go with JSON with a uh, with, uh, configuration file. And there is a script uh, that, again, is more like an example of what you can do, but that's exactly what you do, uh, what you want to do. Um, so take a look at it. Maybe it's enough for you to get a head start, uh, or uh, we can uh, actually, we, we discussed a little bit uh, earlier uh, um, to have an option in the CLI to automatically mm -hmm. generate the JSON starting from the whole database kind of expose everything uh, uh, in the, uh, as a head start again. And, and so. I'll tell you, Rob, thanks for this question, because obviously you're thinking exactly the way we are. I mean, both Davide and I both have written our own little little tools to do something like this. And you probably didn't mean run the query and then immediately make it public. You probably meant help you get started faster because mm -hmm. you have so yeah. much information. Maybe this, maybe there's something there that could actually make a lot of sense and we could bundle together mm -hmm. a tool a tool that kind of helps get started, especially yeah. from a demo or POC point of view, it might be a great way to, to get started. So great Definitely. question and important one too. That sort of thing is, is likely to happen. I mean, even right now, um, if you go in and you try to install the Data API Builder tool, the CLI client, um, going through .NET tool install, um, you'll also see the dab.tool there as well, where you can pass in a connection string. 
it reads all of your tables and automatically yeah. creates the CLI commands for you. That's not a great, it's not a great production strategy, but it's a great way to get started if you just want to, if you have a bunch of tables and you don't want to have to write them all yourself. So um, cool. yeah, we welcome these ideas because yep. the truth is whatever can reduce the friction to getting started, we're on board with. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I see another interesting question from Rob uh, on uh, logging what uh, requests uh, uh, are being serviced by DAB. <clears throat> because, of course, uh, it's important for enterprise uh, point of view to make sure what's to make sure to log what's happening. Right um, now, I may be wrong because, again, uh, I uh, I'm now I'm, I'm more a user of DAB than the, the PM. Uh, but I think we added the uh, integration with App Insight. Am I right? That yeah. So we right. added full. We are, obviously we have full logging and uh, some of the features that will be in the 1.1 will even be additional performance counters for now that we'll be able to like, tie to different thresholds. However, all of that logging, you can go into the configuration file and give your connection string for application insights and it'll automatically ship then up to application insights so that you can see what's going on. You can start seeing how many users, the the IP of those users, the type of, of query and different uh, workloads that are being asked against your API. So it's a good starting point for sure to make sure that it's not just a black box and you don't know what's going on. It can give you some guidance when you're making those decisions of how large should your container be or maybe how many different containers you should have. There are a lot of architectural choices you'll need to make and DAB is really happy with all of them. So you can have it, for example, where you have an, um, you have an, uh, an instance of DAB for every database that you have. You could have an instance of DAB for every schema in your database. You mm -hmm. could have an instance of DAB for five of your backend databases at one time. It's really up to you and the way that you want to kind yeah. of deploy it and the, your really the scalability and the performance thresholds that you're going to set for your own implementation. So the nice thing is it's not DAB says you have to do it this way or the other. You just decide which yeah. is the architecture that fits your kind of modern application or architectural design. And then DAB just snaps in wherever you want it to go. So remember, DAB is completely stateless and it is completely written the way you would have written a .NET yeah. API as well yeah. with all of the policies and all the extra little goodies uh, along the way. So when you're using it, it's not a, oh, I only wish. It, we've already thought of it too because we love writing good code just the way you do and we've added all the features that we would want and that we recognize that our customers are demanding as kind of the entry points into their enterprises anyway. The nice thing too is you might have backend databases that are, you might be using a Postgres today and you feel like that's totally incompatible with Microsoft strategy, but it's not. You can totally use Postgres and it's not a downgrade in DAB. You get complete you know, yeah. capabilities across the board as well. Just like if you were using Microsoft SQL, you could use SQL server on-prem, you could use SQL uh, Azure SQL DB up in the cloud. It's all kind of yeah. up to you. We support MySQL as well. If you're doing a migration from one to another, this is a great way to start by creating a single data endpoint for a backend. And then that kind of magical scenario of where you change your backend database actually occurs, but you don't have to make any changes to your front end API. And so all of your consumers and clients still interact with it exactly the same way without you having to manipulate the payload through like yeah. API manager or something along that line. That's right. And I think in the last uh, um, the last uh, releases, we also had the support for multiple databases, right? So I can choose to have uh, one DAB instance per database, if that suits my um, my kind of architecture, or if yeah. I maybe I just want to do a small POC, uh, I can have one DAB instance pointing to even different database. I can do cross queries at the at the moment, which is uh, I understand why, <laughs> because it can yeah. be tricky. Uh, so it, it really has all the possible configuration that uh, what one can dream of. Yeah. Let me uh, actually let me share my screen just for a yep, second, for and it, I will. I'll just show you just some basic architectural mm -hmm. kind of thinking that we support now in DAB. So here, here we are. This is just your site using an API manager to to um, to be like where denial of service is handled. To be where um, extra security might be applied, to be where you handle versioning for all of your APIs. That's the reason you have API and APIM in the first place. And then you go to the next kind of idea where it's easy to extend it so that if it's more than CRUD operations that you need, then you could easily have what Davide was talking about before, an Azure function or maybe just a small API set that does that one, two, three things that you need. 
So even though you may have some code, you won't have to have the entire CRUD code behind the scenes, and you still get the advantage of updating the engine whenever we release a new version as well. But there's more to think about. So this is where we were kind of going with that. You can have all of these different API, all of these different DAB instance, instances, these containers, pointing to individual databases, but like Davide was kind of alluding to, you can unify all of them to a single endpoint as well by having multiple databases as well. So it's kind of up to you and it's kind of magical to think that you could create an endpoint that does a query against your NoSQL database in the cloud and your relational database on-prem and brings back a unified result set, right? So right now that's built into the GraphQL implementation and it's pretty cool. And so yeah. I think we're actually looking at, I think it, it's um, right now it's only supported in GraphQL, mm -hmm. um, but, and I think multiple data sources is going to be supported in REST, I think by 12. So we should see nice. that in, in GA as well. So it's pretty nice. And nice. then just to keep kind of rolling with it, I mean, to know that we have built in cache and you don't have to do it, that's pretty nice. And you're right, we're going to have these extension points so we can integrate with Redis as well. And they have all pretty much all the major enterprise grade authentication schemes supported. That's pretty nice out of the box too. So it's just not full of, of compromises and the different things that would frustrate you as a developer. So all this discussion is uh, kind of firing up the, the, the chat. So we have a few questions uh, that we should answer. They are super interesting. So. Uh, the first one is, uh, well, uh, Rob asked uh, why they can just use a linked server and basically <laughs> create a SQL server, create a linked server within SQL server and basically connect to other database. Well, you yeah. can do that. Uh, uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, is maybe not suitable if, if you are on Azure SQL because we don't support a linked server there. But uh, right. also, uh, I would say that you... That is probably not a super scalable solution if you are thinking about API, because you always go through a single uh, endpoint, right? Uh, which, uh, I mean, SQL Server can scale quite uh, almost infinitely. With Hyperscale, we can go up to 100 terabyte, but uh, from an API perspective, it's probably better to have a scale out approach. So what I would That's do cool. is create different database, uh, sorry, different uh, data API builder containers, and then scale them out uh, as needed uh, to sustain any workload I may uh, have to receive, um, yeah. which is a little bit more complex to do with the linked server, for example. And also, uh, if you don't need the linked server for something else, you are kind of uh, um, changing your architecture to accommodate that requirement, while instead you can just use, again, DAB with containers. Um, uh, someone, which I'm not Wait, sure. Let me, let me just, let me just yeah. reiterate what you just said to make sure I mm -hmm. understand it. So, I mean, you were saying, Yes, you can le use a linked server if that's the way you want to do it. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, yes. Is that the best uh, practice? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. If your enterprise pushes you down that path and that's the only choice you have to make, oh, DAP yeah. can absolutely not be broken by this. That is for sure. You can that's use right. a linked server and get it. <laughs> However, yes. if you want to separate those things. So think about this. You use a linked server into another database on inside your on-prem scenario, and then you want to move one of those out to the cloud. You don't want to have a linked server across the network like that. So you might move your DAB instance out with your cloud instance then when you do it. So sure. it's great. Yeah. And the truth is all of this is hidden between, behind some sort of APIM so that it makes it so that you can make it so your manager uh, uh, you know, obscures all of this so that yeah. your user never knows what's going on behind the scenes. I see another question from Travis that's talking about scalability as yeah. he's going into production and he needs to scale this up. So. Uh, one thing, one one uh, graphic I didn't show is that you can have multiple DAB containers pointing to the same database. Mm -hmm. So that could happen for a lot of reasons. You could break apart your entities by schema or maybe by domain if you're do if you're domain driven, and all those different ones can be individually serviced by individual containers of DAB to make it so that you could scale. Or it can go even further if you want to load balance through your APIM. You can point that to multiple container instances that all point to the same backend database schema. And it's just up to you how you want to balance those across. The truth of the matter is um, we use DAB internally and it's important for other products at Microsoft that also demand high scale. Yeah. So the odds of you hitting some sort of limitation and some sort of like upper threshold that you just can't get, get uh, from a single container 
is unlikely to happen, but if it does, you can easily break those apart because being stateless, you can have multiple containers all doing the same thing. You can scale your SQL server or whatever it is you're using in the back end up as high as you possibly can. And then you can start building out DAB to, to kind of uh, manage all of that power and then serve it up different ways. You could even separate all of these DAB containers geographically if you wanted to. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. There's a question right. from Varun Davide. Uh, let me see this one. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's you pointing out that light, it works uh, with Postgres and MySQL. Yeah, and can yeah. you show some? Yeah, can you here show some light in how customer can benefit using DTP Builder with Azure Postgres via? Well, the point I guess is that uh, what I like and what I heard uh, really developers uh, love about DAB is that uh, if, let me say in a different way, unless you need some specific SQL feature and that are found in a specific database. Uh, as a developer, as a front-end developer, for example, I see all databases uh, like just a GraphQL or REST API, which means I don't have to deal with database specificity. I can just work uh, at the best of my knowledge uh, on the front-end or maybe in my the microservice I'm using. I don't really right. care about database, right? Now, let's say that for some reason I need to use Postgres because I need that specific feature. Yeah, let's do it. The beauty of that is that I can still use Azure SQL and then use Postgres for that specific feature, but the API will be exactly the same. The way I right. it, uh, interact with each database is the same, which means I'm more efficient because I don't have to learn how to make that query or to connect to that database to use that library, right? So it's very, very nice. And of course... And, uh, and not just the API, but the configuration file is identical. Oh, yeah. You can switch exactly. the connection string and presto, you're using yes. a different database because, I mean, you never know what your line of business application uses as a backend database. Uh, it could be, yeah. you could have just, you know, through mergers and acquisitions, you could find yourself suddenly being a SQL shop and you don't know how to interact with a SQL server, but this makes it easy. Or you find yourself now being a Postgres shop and through using DAB, you can make it even easier to interact with that because it's all a single simple skill set that you can use to interact with all of them, including MySQL, including Cosmos DB as well. So right. you're always saving this developer time and sort of the kind of cognitive load on developers as yeah. they're going across and saying, I want a data API. My back end is Postgres. What do I have to do special for Postgres? Absolutely nothing. That That's the way DAB handles it internally. Yeah. So all you have to do is abstracted away into this simple JSON file that identifies what your That's different right. entities are. And then we also, of course, support integration with InterID. So one of the things you can do is also make sure that your endpoint, because at this point we are discussing about uh, authenticating the endpoint usage, not authenticating against uh, SQL. Of course, uh, if you are running DAB in a container, you can always use, uh, or even with static web apps, you can always use uh, managed uh, uh, identities to make mm -hmm. sure that the connection between DAB and database is passwordless. It's the most secure one. So that is taken care of for you already. But then you, you still have the, let's say, the challenge to make sure that your endpoint are, are also authenticated. We don't do authentication, period. Like there is no authentication logic in DAB. There is authorization logic, which is also pretty nice. Maybe we will cover in the next. Uh, uh, community stand up, but authentication, we just uh, rely on third parties. Of course, EntraID is our first party, third party authentication, uh, but then you can use uh, any open ID uh, kind of authentication provider. Yeah, that's right. And speaking of which, since we're not, we, we don't do the uh, authorization, um, uh, the authentication, sorry. The authentication, yeah. In the same way, we don't do load balancing. So there's one yeah. other question here that we have around, is yeah. there some type of load balancing in the background? And the quick answer, is absolutely not. And that's because we're not building a load balancer. We'll bu we're building a data API engine. And if you need load balancing because you've gotten to some level of throughput or some level of traffic that you need to balance it, there are tools that are actual load balancers to do just that. Yeah. So think about the overall architecture of your application, not just this one component. This one component can't be the answer to everything. This one component solves a single problem and it's that single problem of your data API on top of your backend databases. There are tons of like secondary benefits by using DAB and it's more than just saving code. You also get all of this consistency and this sort of um, this uh, sort of singular training you can do across all of your uh, developer teams. But those are just ancillary benefits. The, the reason DAB is, is here in the first place is because it's meant to be a data API on top of your database exposes both REST and GraphQL for yeah. you. 
Now, Jerry, let me share my screen since I guess we need to wrap up because it's just a couple of minutes before the end. But I really want to um, share uh, this uh, entire screen. Here we go. Uh, because not only the documentation is greatly maintained, so you go to the documentation, it's uh, it's the official Microsoft documentation, right? Again, it's a... Right. Right. It's, it's still open source, but we wanted to do the thing just like uh, we do for any other uh, Microsoft product. So you have full documentation here, very often updated. And then both from the documentation, also from the GitHub repository, you have access to a huge amount of samples. So you have a complete getting started guide that will uh, guide you to build uh, a sample using the books, authors, creating the relationship. Right. You have a uh, plenty of in, C in, in SQL, in Postgres, oh, in my all of them. That's right, in all databases. That's right. And then here you have uh, also, uh, uh, here we go, a dedicated uh, repository only for uh, uh, DTP Builder samples, where you have samples for end to end, because that's the goal of DTP Builder, help you to build an end to end solution, right? Uh, using uh, all of the databases. So you have the to-do app uh, using SQL, you have uh, the library manager or tour wonders. This is uh, in uh, Cosmos. Uh, if you build any samples, let us know. We'll be happy to add it here. Um, but this um, is something you can just download, deploy, and uh, for example, in this case, goes through a, a Jumpstack solution using static web app CLI, uh, deploying the database as part of the solution. Uh, it's uh, um, it's very complete and again, end to end gives you a, a good overview of uh, uh, how DTP Builder can help you to be just more productive. Basically, the boiling point is, is that you don't think about database anymore. You just think about what you have to do and that's beautiful. Yeah, that's right. Uh, All right, let's let's just end with, um, I, have a, I have a list of resources that might be valuable for you mm -hmm. if you're just mm -hmm. getting started with DAB. Um, it is perhaps the best starting place for you to go to. It shows both the repository, but also it shows the registry because this is a regular MCR container that you'll be using right. through Docker. Nothing special about that. You'll just pull from the registry there or the Docker hub as well. Um, and this is great. So we're going to have a community stand up for Data API Builder at the first Wednesday of every month going forward until we decide not to. And this is the right place if you have burning questions and you want to ask them, the repository is the right place to go and submit an issue. But if you have a question that uh, maybe doesn't feel like an issue, you can put that into discussion or you can bring it to the next community stand up. We're happy to talk about that as well. There's a lot of things here that I'm sure that we haven't covered. I look forward to covering a lot of the pieces that are maybe a little bit more subtle and maybe a little bit less intuitive. So we can kind of show how to use those and how to get started with those as well next month. Davide, anything uh, anything we missed? Uh, I think people are asking you to follow up on Kyoto, something interesting, right? Uh, in the Azure API uh, management integration, that's it. Um, so we already know the topic for the next uh, community stand up, apparently. Yeah, perfect. Uh, don't miss out. Uh, so there's a whole set of blogs at the, yep. uh, the SQL Dev Center blogs. Um, one of them is interact integration of DAB and Kyoto. So we may have beat you to the punch on that one, Rob. But thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that you know all these different pieces. And uh, until next month, I'll see you then, Davide. Yeah, see you soon, man. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.